This is Unfuck the Poor, and we're just going to jump right into it. My New Year's resolution is to get 12 more subscribers, doubling the number of subscribers that I already have. That's it, just 12. So go ahead and give us five stars to help us show up on searches. I, I think that's how that works. So just, you know, five stars, they're right there. Just push them, click the five stars with your finger, and they light up. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go tell your friends. You could tell your friends. It doesn't matter. Just, it doesn't matter. This is a horrible intro. Today's episode is a continuation of last week's episode, which was dedicated to Rachel Corey, the Olympia, Washington student activist volunteer who lost her life to Israeli troops in March of 2003, 20 years ago. Corey died when she was crushed under a Caterpillar D9R bulldozer, officially recognized by Guinness World Records as the most heavily armed bulldozer in the world and the prized possession of the Israeli military. Today's episode is a bit different. These are Rachel's emails to her friends and family while she was volunteering in Gaza up to a few days before her death. I think you'll find them relevant today as they were two decades ago. Only two names have changed. Ariel Sharon was the Israeli prime minister at the time of Corey's death, and George W. Bush was president. When you hear Sharon and Bush, that's who Rachel is referring to. You can substitute in Netanyahu and Biden, and the emails retain their timeliness. Also, just for reference, when Rachel uses the anagram ISM, she is referring to the International Solidarity Movement. These emails can be found at rachelcoreyfoundation.org. Please feel free to browse and learn more about Corey's life. Leaving Olympia, January 2003. We're all born, and someday we'll all die, most likely to some degree alone. What if our aloneness isn't a tragedy? What if our aloneness is what allows us to speak the truth without being afraid. What if our aloneness is what allows us to adventure, to experience the world as a dynamic presence, as a changeable, interactive thing? If I lived in Bosnia or Rwanda or who knows where else, needless death wouldn't be a distant symbol to me. It wouldn't be a metaphor. It would be reality. And I have no right to this metaphor, but I use it to console myself, to give a fraction of meaning to something enormous and needless. This realization, this realization that I will live my life in this world where I have privileges. I can't cool boiling waters in Russia. I can't be Picasso. I can't be Jesus. I can't save the planet single-handedly. I can wash dishes. Emails from Palestine, February 7th, 2003. I've been in Palestine for two weeks and one hour now, and I still have... Very few words to describe what I see. It is most difficult for me to think about what's going on here when I sit down to write back to the United States. Something about the virtual portal into luxury. I don't know if many of the children here have ever existed without tank shell holes in their walls and the towers of an occupying army surveying them constantly from the near horizons. I think, although I'm not entirely sure, that even the smallest of these children understand that life is not like this everywhere. An eight-year-old was shot and killed by an Israeli tank two days before I got here, and many of the children murmur his name to me, Ali, or point at the posters of him on the walls. The children also love to get me to practice my limited Arabic by asking me, Kaif Sharon, Kaif Bush, and they laugh when I say Bush Majnun, Sharon Majnun, back in my limited Arabic. How is Sharon? How is Bush? Bush is crazy. Sharon is crazy. Of course, this isn't quite what I believe. And some of the adults who have the English correct me. Bush Mish Majnun. Bush is a businessman. Today I tried to learn to say Bush is a tool, but I don't think it translated quite right. But anyway, there are eight-year-olds here much more aware of the workings of the global power structure than I was just a few years ago. Nevertheless, no amount of reading, attendance at conferences, documentary viewing, and word of mouth could have prepared me for the reality of the situation here. You just can't imagine it until you see it. And even then, you are always well aware that your experience of it is not at all the reality. What with the difficulties the Israeli army would face if they shot an unarmed U.S. citizen, and with the fact that I have money to buy water when the army destroys wells, and the fact, of course, that I have the option of leaving. Nobody in my family has been shot driving in their car by a rocket launcher from a tower at the end of a major street in my hometown. I have a home. I am allowed to go see the ocean. Ostensibly, it is still quite difficult for me to be held for months or years on end without a trial. This because I am a white U.S. citizen, as opposed to so many others. 
When I leave for work or school, I can be relatively certain that there will not be a heavily armed soldier waiting halfway between Mud Bay and downtown Olympia at a checkpoint with the power to decide whether I can go about my business and whether I can get home again when I'm done. So if I feel outrage at arriving and entering briefly and incompletely into the world in which these children exist, I wonder, conversely, about how it would be for them to arrive in my world. They know that children in the United States don't usually have their parents shot, and they know they sometimes get to see the ocean. But once you have seen the ocean and lived in a silent place, where water is taken for granted and not stolen in the night by bulldozers, and once you have spent an evening when you haven't wondered if the walls of your home might suddenly fall inward, waking you from your sleep, and once you've met people who have never lost anyone, once you have experienced the reality of a world that isn't surrounded by murderous towers, tanks, armed settlements, and now a giant metal wall, I wonder if you can forgive the world for all the years of your childhood spent existing, just existing, in resistance to the constant stranglehold of the world's fourth largest military, backed by the world's only superpower, in its attempt to erase you from your home. That is something I wonder about these children. I wonder what would happen if they really knew. As an afterthought to all this rambling, I am in Rafa, a city of about 140,000 people, approximately 60% of whom are refugees, many of whom are twice or three times refugees. Rafa existed prior to 1948, but most of the people here are themselves or are descendants of people who were relocated here from their homes in historic Palestine, now Israel. Rafa was split in half when the Sinai returned to Egypt. Currently, the Israeli army is building a 14-meter high wall between Rafa and Palestine and the border, carving a no-man's land from the houses along the border. 602 homes have been completely bulldozed, according to the Rafa Popular Refugee Committee. The number of homes that have been partially destroyed is greater. Today, as I walked on top of the rubble where homes once stood, Egyptian soldiers called to me from the other side of the border. Go, go, because a tank was coming, and then waving, and what's your name? Something disturbing about this friendly curiosity, it reminded me of how much, to some degree, we're all kids curious about other kids. Egyptian kids shouting at strange women wandering into the path of tanks. Palestinian kids shot from the tanks when they peek out from behind walls to see what's going on. International kids standing in front of tanks with banners. Israeli kids in the tanks anonymously, occasionally shouting and also occasionally waving. Many forced to be here, many just aggressive shooting into the houses as we wander away. In addition to the constant presence of tanks along the border and in the western region between Rafa and the settlements along the coast, there are more IDF towers here than I can count. Along the horizon at the end of the streets, some just army green metal, others these strange spiral staircases draped in some kind of netting to make the activity within anonymous, some hidden just beneath the horizon of buildings. A new one went up the other day in the time it took us to do laundry and to cross town twice to hang banners. Despite the fact that some of the areas nearest the border are the original Rafa with families who have lived on this land for at least a century, only the 1948 camps in the center of the city are Palestinian-controlled areas under Oslo. But as far as I can tell, there are few, if any, places that are not within the sights of some tower or another. Certainly there is no place invulnerable to Apache helicopters, or to the cameras of invisible drones we hear buzzing over the city for hours at a time. I've been having trouble accessing news about the outside world here, but I hear an escalation of war on Iraq is inevitable. There's a great deal of concern here about the reoccupation of Gaza. Gaza is reoccupied every day to various extents, but I think the fear is that the tanks will enter all the streets and remain here instead of entering some of the streets and then withdrawing after some hours or days to observe and shoot from the edges of the communities. If people aren't already thinking about the consequences of this war for the people of the entire region, then I hope you will start. I also hope you'll come here. We've been wavering between five and six internationals. The neighborhoods that have asked us for some form of presence are Yibna, Tel El Sultan, High Salam, Brazil, Block J, Zorab, and Block O. There's also need for constant nighttime presence at a well on the outskirts of Rafa since the Israeli army destroyed the two largest wells. According to the Municipal Water Office, the wells destroyed last week provided half of Rafa's water supply. Many of the communities have requested internationals to be present at night to attempt to shield houses from further demolition. After about 10 p.m., it is very difficult to move at night because the Israeli army treats anyone in the streets as resistance and shoots at them. So clearly, we are too few. I continue to believe that my home, Olympia, could gain a lot and offer a lot by deciding to make a commitment to Rafa in the form of a sister community relationship. 
Some teachers and children's groups have expressed interest in email exchanges, but this is only the tip of the iceberg of solidarity work that might be done. Many people want their voices to be heard, and I think we need to use some of our privilege as internationals to get those voices heard directly in the U.S. rather than through the filter of well-meaning internationals such as myself. I'm just beginning to learn from what I expect to be very intense tutelage about the ability of people to organize against all odds and to resist against all odds. Thanks for the news I've been getting from friends in the U.S. I just read a report back from a friend who organized a peace group in Shelton, Washington, and was able to be part of a delegation to the large January 18th protest in Washington, D.C. People here watched the media, and they told me again today that there have been large protests in the United States and problems for the government in the U.K., So thanks for allowing me to not feel like a complete Pollyanna when I tentatively tell people here that many of the people in the United States do not support the policies of our government and that we are learning from global examples how to resist. My love to everyone, my love to mom, my love to smooch, my love to FG and Barnhair and Sesame's and Lincoln School. My love to Olympia, Rachel. February 20th, 2003. Mama. Now the Israeli army has actually dug up the road to Gaza, and both of the major checkpoints are closed. This means that Palestinians who want to go and register for their next quarter at university can't. People can't get to their jobs, and those who are trapped on the other side can't get home. And internationals, who have a meeting tomorrow in the West Bank, won't make it. We could probably make it through if we made serious use of our international white person privilege, but that would also mean some risk of arrest and deportation, even though none of us has done anything illegal. The Gaza Strip is divided in thirds now. There is some talk about the reoccupation of Gaza, but I seriously doubt this will happen because I think it would be a geopolitically stupid move for Israel right now. I think the more likely thing is an increase in smaller, below-the-international outcry radar incursions and possibly the oft-hinted population transfer. I'm staying put in Rafah for now, no plans to head north. I still feel like I'm relatively safe, and I think that my most likely risk in case of a larger-scale incursion is arrest. A move to reoccupy Gaza would generate a much larger outcry than Sharon's assassination during peace negotiations slash land grab strategy, which is which is working very well now to create settlements all over, slowly but surely eliminating any meaningful possibility for Palestinian self-determination. Know that I have a lot of very nice Palestinians looking after me. I have a small flu bug and got some very nice lemony drinks to cure me. Also, the woman who keeps the key for the well where we still sleep keeps asking me about you. She doesn't speak a bit of English, but she asks about my mom pretty frequently. Wants to make sure I'm calling you. Love to you and dad and Sarah and Chris and everybody. Rachel. February 27th, 2003, to her mother. Love you. Really miss you. I've had bad nightmares about tanks and bulldozers outside our house and you and me inside. Sometimes the adrenaline acts as an anesthetic for weeks And then in the evenings or at night, it just hits me again. A little bit of the reality of the situation. I am really scared for the people here. Yesterday, I watched a father lead his two tiny children holding his hands out into the sight of tanks and a sniper tower and bulldozers and jeeps because he thought his house was going to be exploded. Jenny and I stayed in the house with several women and two small babies. It was our mistake in translation that caused him to think it was his house that was going to be exploded. In fact, the Israeli army was in the process of detonating an explosive in the ground nearby, one that appears to have been planted by Palestinian resistance. This is in the area where Sunday about 150 men were rounded up and contained outside the settlement with gunfire over their heads and around them, while tanks and bulldozers destroyed 25 greenhouses, the livelihoods for 300 people. The explosive was right in front of the greenhouse, right in the point of entry for tanks that might come back again. I was terrified to think that this man felt it was less of a risk to walk out in view of the tanks with his kids than to stay in his house. I was really scared that they were going to be shot, and I tried to stand between them and the tank. This happens every day, but just this father walking out with his two little kids, just looking very sad, just happened to get my attention more at this particular moment, probably because I felt it was our translation problems that made him leave. I thought a lot about what you said on the phone about Palestinian violence not helping the situation. 60,000 workers from Rafah worked in Israel two years ago. Now, only 600 can go to Israel for jobs. Of these 600, many have moved, because the three checkpoints between here and Ashkelon, the closest city in Israel, make what used to be a 40-minute drive now a 12-hour or impassable journey. 
In addition, what Rafa identified in 1999 as sources of economic growth are all completely destroyed. The Gaza International Airport, runways demolished, totally closed. The border for trade with Egypt, now with a giant Israeli sniper tower in the middle of the crossing. Access to the ocean, completely cut off in the last two years by a checkpoint and the Gush Katif settlement. The count of homes destroyed in Rafah since the beginning of this intifada is up around 600. By and large, people with no connection to the resistance, but who happen to live along the border. I think it is maybe official now that Rafah is the poorest place in the world. There used to be a middle class here, recently. We also get reports that in the past, Gazan flower shipments to Europe were delayed for two weeks at the era's crossing for security inspections. You can imagine the value of two-week-old cut flowers in the European market. So that market dried up. And then the bulldozers come and take out people's vegetable farms and gardens. What is left for people? Tell me if you can think of anything. I can't. If any of us had our lives and welfare completely strangled, lived with children in a shrinking place where we knew, because of previous experience, that soldiers and tanks and bulldozers could come for us at any moment and destroy all the greenhouses that we had been cultivating for however long and did this while some of us were beaten and held captive with 149 other people for several hours, do you think we might try to use somewhat violent means to protect whatever fragments remained? I think about this especially when I see orchards and greenhouses and fruit trees destroyed. Just years of care and cultivation. I think about you and how long it takes to make things grow and what a labor of love it is. I really think in a similar situation, most people would defend themselves as best they could. I think Uncle Craig would. I think probably Grandma would. I think I would. You asked me about nonviolent resistance. When that explosive detonated yesterday, it broke all the windows in the family's house. I was in the process of being served tea and playing with the two small babies. Just feel sick to my stomach a lot from being doted on all the time, very sweetly by people who are facing doom. I know that from the United States, it all sounds like hyperbole. Honestly, a lot of the time, the sheer kindness of the people here, coupled with the overwhelming evidence of the willful destruction of their lives, makes it seem unreal to me. I really can't believe that something like this can happen in the world without a bigger outcry about it. It really hurts me, again, like it has hurt me in the past to witness how awful we can allow the world to be. I felt after talking to you that maybe you didn't completely believe me. I think it's actually good if you don't, because I do believe pretty much above all else in the importance of independent critical thinking. And I also realize that with you, I'm much less careful than usual about trying to source every assertion that I make. A lot of the reason for that is I know that you actually do go and do your own research. But it makes me worry about the job I'm doing. All of the situation that I tried to enumerate above, and a lot of other things, constitutes a somewhat gradual, often hidden but nevertheless massive, removal and destruction of the ability of a particular group of people to survive. This is what I'm seeing here. The assassinations, rocket attacks, and shooting of children are atrocities, but in focusing on them, I'm terrified of missing their context. The vast majority of people here, even if they had the economic means to escape, even if they actually wanted to give up resisting on their land and just leave, which appears to be maybe the less nefarious of Sharon's possible goals, can't leave. Because they can't even get into Israel to apply for visas, and because their destination countries won't let them in, both our country and Arab countries. So I think when all means of survival is cut off in a pen, Gaza, which people can't get out of, I think that qualifies as genocide. Even if they could get out, I think it would still qualify as genocide. Maybe you could look up the definition of genocide according to international law. I don't remember it right now. I'm going to get better at illustrating this, hopefully. I don't like to use those charged words. I think you know this about me. I really value words. I really try to illustrate and let people draw their own conclusions. Anyway, I'm rambling. Just want to write to my mom and tell her that I'm witnessing this chronic, insidious genocide, and I'm really scared and questioning my fundamental belief in the goodness of human nature. This has to stop. I think it is a good idea for us all to drop everything and devote our lives to making this stop. I don't think it's an extremist thing to do anymore. I still really want to dance around to Pat Benatar and have boyfriends and make comics for my coworkers, but I also want this to stop. Disbelief and horror is what I feel. Disappointment. I am disappointed that this is the base reality of our world and that we, in fact, participate in it. This is not at all what I asked for when I came into this world. This is not at all what the people here asked for when they came into the world. 
This is not the world you and dad wanted me to come into when you decided to have me. This is not what I meant when I looked at Capital Lake and said, this is the wide world and I'm coming to it. I did not mean that I was coming into a world where I could live a comfortable life and possibly, with no effort at all, exist in complete unawareness of my participation in genocide. More big explosion somewhere in the distance outside. When I come back from Palestine, I probably will have nightmares and constantly feel guilty for not being here. But I can channel that into more work. Coming here is one of the better things I've ever done, so when I sound crazy or if the Israeli military should break with their racist tendency not to injure white people, please pin the reason squarely on the fact that I am in the midst of a genocide, which I am also indirectly supporting, and for which my government is largely responsible. I love you and Dad. Sorry for the diatribe. Okay, some strange men next to me just gave me some peas, so I need to eat and thank them. Rachel, February 28th, 2003, to her mother. Thanks, Mom, for your response to my email. It really helps me to get word from you and from other people who care about me. After I wrote to you, I went incommunicado from the affinity group for about 10 hours, which I spent with the family on the front line in High Salam, who fixed me dinner, and they have cable TV. The two front rooms of their house are unusable because gunshots have been fired through the walls, so the whole family, three kids and two parents, sleep in the parents' bedroom. I sleep on the floor next to the youngest daughter, Eamon, and we all shared blankets. I helped the son with his English homework a little, and we all watched Pet Cemetery, which is a horrifying movie. I think they all thought it was pretty funny how much trouble I had watching it. Friday is the holiday, and when I woke up, they were watching gummy bears dubbed into Arabic. So I ate breakfast with them and sat there for a while and just enjoyed being in this big puddle of blankets with this family, watching what for me seemed like Saturday morning cartoons. Then I walked some way to Brazil, which is where Nidal and Mansur and Grandmother and Rafat and all the rest of the big family that has really wholeheartedly adopted me live. The other day, by the way, Grandmother gave me a pantomime lecture in Arabic that involved a lot of blowing and pointing to her black shawl. I got Nidal to tell her that my mother would appreciate knowing that someone here was giving me a lecture about smoking, turning my lungs black. I met their sister-in-law who was visiting from Nusrat camp and played with her small baby. Nidal's English gets better every day. He's the one who calls me my sister. He started teaching grandmother how to say, hello, how are you, in English. You can always hear the tanks and bulldozers passing by, but all of these people are genuinely cheerful with each other, and with me. When I am with Palestinian friends, I tend to be somewhat less horrified than when I am trying to act in a role of human rights observer, documenter, or direct action resistor. They are a good example of how to be in it for the long haul. I know that the situation gets to them and may ultimately get them on all kinds of levels, but I am nevertheless amazed at their strength in being able to defend such a large degree of their humanity, laughter, generosity, family time, against the incredible horror occurring in their lives and against the constant presence of death. I felt much better after this morning. I spent a lot of time writing about the disappointment of discovering somewhat firsthand the degree of evil which we are still capable. I should at least mention that I am also discovering a degree of strength and of basic ability for humans to remain human in the direst of circumstances, which I also haven't seen before. I think the word is dignity. I wish you could meet these people. Maybe, hopefully, someday you will. I think I could see a Palestinian state or a democratic Israeli-Palestinian state within my lifetime. I think freedom for Palestine could be an incredible source of hope to people struggling all over the world. I think it could also be an incredible inspiration to Arab people in the Middle East who are struggling under undemocratic regimes which the U.S. supports. I look forward to increasing numbers of middle-class privileged people like you and me becoming aware of the structures that support our privilege and beginning to support the work of those who aren't privileged to dismantle those structures. I look forward to more moments like February 15th when civil society wakes up en masse and issues massive and resonant evidence of its conscience, its unwillingness to be repressed, and its compassion for the suffering of others. I look forward to more teachers emerging like Matt Grant and Barbara Weaver and Dale Knuth who teach critical thinking to kids in the United States. I look forward to the international resistance that's occurring now, fertilizing analysis on all kinds of issues with dialogue between diverse groups of people. I look forward to all of us who are new at this, developing better skills for working in democratic structures and healing our own racism and classism and sexism and heterosexism and ageism and ableism and becoming more effective. One other thing, I think this a lot about public protest. 
like the one a few weeks ago here that was attended by only about 150 people. Whenever I organize or participate in public protest, I get really worried that it will just suck, be really small, embarrassing, and the media will laugh at me. Oftentimes it is really small, and most of the time the media laughs at us. The weekend after our 150-person protest, we were invited to a maybe 2,000-person protest. Even though we had a small protest, and of course it didn't get coverage all over the world, in some places of the world, Rafa was mentioned outside of the Arab press. Colin got a sign in English and Arabic into the protest in Seattle that said, Olympia says no to war on Rafa in Iraq. His pictures went up on the Rafa Today website that a guy named Mohammed here runs. People here and elsewhere saw those pictures. I think about Glenn going out every Friday for 10 years with tagboard signs that address the number of children dead from sanctions in Iraq. Sometimes just one or two people there, and everyone thought they were crazy and they got spit upon. Now there are a lot more people on Friday evenings. The juncture between fourth and state is just lined with them, and they get a lot of honks and waves and thumbs up. They created an infrastructure there for other people to do something. Getting spit on, they made it easier for someone else to decide that they could write a letter to the editor or stand at the back of a rally or do something that seems slightly less ridiculous than standing at the side of the road addressing the deaths of children in Iraq and getting spit upon. Just hearing about what you are doing makes me feel less alone, less useless, less invisible. Those honks and waves help. The pictures help. Colin helps. The international media and our government are not going to tell us that we are effective, important, justified in our work, courageous, intelligent, valuable. We have to do that for each other, and one way we can do that is by continuing our work visibly. I also think it's important for people in the United States in relative privilege to realize that people without privilege will be doing this work no matter what because they are working for their lives. We can work with them, and they know that we work with them, or we can leave them to do this work themselves and curse us for our complicity in killing them. I really don't get the sense that anyone here curses us. I also get the sense that people here in particular are actually more concerned in the immediate about our comfort and health than they are about us risking our lives on their behalf. At least that's the case for me. People try to give me a lot of tea and food in the midst of gunfire and explosive detonation. I love you, Rachel. And this is Rachel's last email written to her father. Hi, Papa. Thank you for your email. I feel like sometimes I spend all my time propagandizing mom and assuming she'll pass stuff on to you, so you get neglected. Don't worry about me too much. Right now, I'm most concerned that we are not being effective. I still don't feel particularly at risk. Rafa has never seemed calmer lately, maybe because the military is preoccupied with incursions in the north, still shooting and house demolitions. One death this week that I know of, but not any larger incursions. Still can't say how this will change if and when war with Iraq comes. Thanks also for stepping up your anti-war work. I know it is not easy to do and probably much more difficult where you are than where I am. I'm really interested in talking to the journalist in Charlotte. Let me know what I can do to speed the process along. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I leave here and when I'm going to leave. Right now, I think I could stay until June financially. I really don't want to move back to Olympia, but do need to go back there to clean my stuff out of the garage and talk about my experiences here. On the other hand, now that I've crossed the ocean, I'm feeling a strong desire to try to stay across the ocean for some time. Considering trying to get English teaching jobs, would really like to buckle down and learn Arabic. Also got an invitation to visit Sweden on my way back, which I think I could do very cheaply. I would like to leave Rafa with a viable plan to return, too. One of the core members of our group has to leave tomorrow, and watching her say goodbye to people is making me realize how difficult it will be. People here can't leave, so that complicates things. They are also pretty matter-of-fact about the fact they don't know if they will be alive when we come back. I really don't want to live with a lot of guilt about this place being able to come and go so easily and not going back. I think it is valuable to make commitments to places, so I would like to be able to plan on coming back here within a year or so. Of all these possibilities, I think it's most likely that I will at least go to Sweden for a few weeks on my way back. I can change tickets and get a plane from Paris to Sweden and back for a total of about 150 bucks or so. I know I should really try to link up with the family in France, but I really think that I'm not going to do that. I think I would just be angry the whole time and not much fun to be around. It also seems like a transition into too much opulence right now. I would feel a lot of class guilt the whole time as well. 
Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if you have any ideas about what I should do with the rest of my life. I love you very much. If you want, you can write to me as if I was on vacation at a camp. One thing I do to make things easier here is to utterly retreat into fantasies that I am in a Hollywood movie or a sitcom starring Michael J. Fox. So feel free to make something up and I'll be happy to play along. Much love, Poppy. Rachel. It's extreme, extremely disappointing verdict, of course. Um, and uh, it's disappointing for uh, everyone who knew Rachel's fam- Rachel, in particular for Rachel's family, who've uh, been working for so long uh, for justice. Uh, and I think it should be disappointing for anybody who uh, cares about justice and who cares about truth in Israel and Palestine. Uh, and I can say it on the basis of what I saw on that day in 2003 and on the basis of what I told the court. Uh, I don't think it's a credible verdict which accurately reflects what, what happened. Uh, I don't think um, that it can simply be dismissed as an accident. I'm absolutely clear that the bulldozer driver would have been able to see Rachel. Um, it was a clear day. Rachel was standing in open ground wearing a high visibility vest and the bulldozer, bulldozer driver uh, moved toward her from 20 or 30 metres away um, and absolutely would have had a chance to see her as she stood uh, in, one, in one place, motionless, uh, during that time. Um, and uh, just as the bulldozer got to her, it had gathered up uh, a pile of earth in front of its scoop that was, that was moving in front of it. And she was forced to climb on top of that moving mound of earth. And as she did so, her head uh, moved above the top of the bulldozer blade. Uh, and at that, at that time, before she fell down, was only uh, a metre or two metres or three metres, perhaps, away from uh, the head of the driver. So for me, uh, it's absolutely implausible that uh, the driver wasn't, una- wasn't able to see him. For the Corrie family and for activists who've been following this case, there wasn't a great deal of surprise, unfortunately, about today's verdict. Uh, and the reason for that is that those of us who follow events in Israel and Palestine are aware that uh, day in, day out, uh, in the West Bank, in Gaza, in, in, and in East Jerusalem, uh, things happen, uh, things are carried out by uh, the Israeli army, which ought to lead to the conviction of soldiers, uh, but which doesn't. Uh, and I think that we perceive there to be a general culture of impunity uh, amongst the Israeli military, uh, of which today's verdict is an expression. That concludes the final holiday bonus episode of Unfuck the Poor, dedicated to American activist Rachel Corey. Since October 7th, 2023, over 20,000 Palestinians have been killed by the Israeli military, and over 50,000 have been wounded. About half of those are children. I don't want you to donate to anything. I want you to check out the social media of Palestinian citizen journalists who have been documenting the genocide in Gaza since October 7th. Uh, you can find them on Instagram, Motaz Azaza at Motaz underscore Azaza, Plestia Aliquot at by Plestia, Hind Huderi at Hind Huderi. Follow them, like them, share their stories. We can at least live up to the second goal of the international solidarity movement, documentation. As a kid, the story of the Jewish Holocaust made a huge impact on how I see the world, how I interact with other races and religions. The phrase, never again, is not reserved solely for the Jewish Holocaust, but it is a testament against all genocide. Never again means never again for anyone.